Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be addressing a conference of pastors and their wives. I greatly admire and applaud your service to the local body of Christ. And unfortunately, as you can tell, I'm uh, struggling with uh, somewhat of a sore throat. Uh, but I hope with a little bit of coffee here that I'll be able to get through my remarks that I wanted to share with you today and then take some questions afterwards. At our home church in Atlanta, I teach a Sunday school class of about 100 people called Defenders from high schoolers to senior adults. We talk about what the Bible teaches or Christian doctrine and about how to defend it or Christian apologetics. Sometimes people who are not in our class uh, don't understand what we're doing. One fine southern lady, uh, upon hearing that I teach apologetics, indignantly remarked to me, I'll never apologize for my faith. <laughs> well, the reason for her understanding is obvious. Apologetics sounds like apologize. But apologetics is not the art of telling people that you're sorry that you're a Christian. Rather, apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, which means a defense, as in a court of law. And Christian apologetics involves giving a defense of the truth of the Christian faith. The Bible actually commands us to have such a defense ready to give to an unbeliever who asks us why we believe as we do. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to give a defense, an apologia, to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you. But do this with gentleness and respect. Now notice the attitude that we're supposed to have in making our defense. We're to be gentle and respectful. Apologetics is also not the art of making somebody else sorry that you're a Christian. We can give a defense of the Christian faith without becoming defensive. We can give arguments for Christianity without becoming argumentative. And I think that it's vitally important that Christians be trained in the art of defending their faith. Let me give three reasons in support of this belief. Number one, shaping culture. Shaping culture. We've all heard of the so-called culture war going on in American society. Now some people might not like this militaristic metaphor, but the fact of the matter is that there is a tremendous struggle for the soul of America that is raging right now. This struggle is not just political. It has a religious or spiritual dimension as well. Secularists are bent on eliminating religion from the public square. The so-called new atheists like Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, and Christopher Hitchens are even more aggressive. They want to exterminate religion entirely from American society, even from your private life. American society has already become post-Christian. Belief in a sort of generic God is still the norm, but it has become politically incorrect to believe in Jesus Christ. How many films coming out of Hollywood, for example, portray Christians in a positive way? How many times do we find instead Christians portrayed as bigoted, shallow, villainous hypocrites? What's the public perception of Bible-believing Christians in our culture today. We'll take a look at this cartoon. This cartoon forcibly illustrates the perception of Christians on the part of the cultural elite in American society today. Goofy doofuses to be gawked at by ordinary people. But notice the sign. They're also dangerous. Caution, says the sign. These people mustn't be allowed positions of influence in society. 
Maybe that's why they even need to be penned up. Now, why are these considerations of culture important? Why can't we Christians just be faithful followers of Christ and ignore what is going on in contemporary culture? Why not just preach the gospel to a dark and dying world? Well, the answer is because the gospel is never heard in isolation. It is always heard against the backdrop of the culture in which a person was born and raised. A person who is raised in a culture which is still sympathetic to Christian faith will be open to the gospel in a way that a person brought up in a secular culture will not. For a person who is thoroughly secularized, you may as well tell him to believe in leprechauns or fairies as in Jesus Christ. It will appear that absurd to him. If America's slide into secularism continues, then what awaits us tomorrow in America is already evident today in Europe. Europe has become so secularized that it's hard for the gospel even to get a fair hearing. As a result, missionaries must labor for years to win even a handful of converts. If the gospel is to be heard as an intellectually viable option for thinking men and women today, then it's vital that we as Christians try to shape American culture in such a way that Christian belief cannot be dismissed merely as superstition. Now this will involve impacting the American university. You see, the American university is the single most important institution shaping American culture. It is at the university that our future political leaders, our journalists, our lawyers, our teachers, our business executives will be trained. It is at the university that they will formulate or more probably simply absorb the worldview that shapes their lives. And as a result, it will be the worldview that shapes our culture because these are the opinion makers and movers and shakers who shape American culture. The recent Supreme Court decision in the Hobby Lobby case illustrates the importance of the university in shaping culture. These nine justices are graduates of the most prestigious universities and law schools in the United States. Our religious freedom hangs upon the decisions that they make. A shift of just one vote in the Hobby Lobby case would have resulted in the abridgment of religious liberty in this country. Now where do these judges get their worldviews that shape their decisions? From the university. If we change the university, then we change culture through those who shape culture. If the Christian worldview can be restored to a place of prominence and respect at the American university, it will have a leavening effect throughout society. The great Princeton theologian J. Gresham Machen rightly declared, and I quote, false ideas are the greatest obstacles to the reception of the gospel. We may preach with all the fervor of a reformer and yet succeed only in winning a straggler here and there if we permit the whole collective thought of the nation to be controlled by ideas which prevent Christianity from being regarded as anything more than a harmless delusion. Under such circumstances, said Machen, what God desires us to do is to destroy the obstacle at its root. The root of the obstacle is to be found in the university, and it is there that it must be attacked. And it can be done. We are living at a time in history when Christian philosophy is experiencing a veritable renaissance at a time when contemporary physics is more open to the existence of a creator and designer of the cosmos than at any time 
in recent memory, and at a time when historical scholars have embarked upon a renewed quest of the historical Jesus, which has confirmed the reliability of the broad outlines of the portrait of Jesus painted in the Gospels. If our churches can help members of our younger generation to see a career in Christian scholarship as God's calling upon their lives, and if Christian laymen can be equipped to provide good answers to unbelievers' questions and to give solid reasons for why we believe as we do, then the perception of Christians in our culture will slowly change. Christians will come to be seen as thoughtful people, to be taken seriously, rather than as emotional and narrow-minded fanatics. Becoming a Christian will be a reasonable and attractive option for thinking people. Now, I'm not saying that people will become Christians because of the arguments and evidence. Some will. But the more fundamental point I'm making is that the arguments and evidence help to create a culture in which Christian belief is a reasonable thing to embrace. They create an environment in which people will be open to the preaching of the gospel. Being trained in apologetics is one way, a vital way, of being salt and light in American culture today. Number two, strengthening believers. Strengthening believers. The benefits of apologetics in one's personal Christian life are huge. First of all, knowing why you believe as you do, as well as what you believe, will make you more confident in sharing your faith with others. I see this happen all the time on the university campuses on which I debate. Over the last 30 years, I have debated the world's most prominent agnostics and atheists on university campuses across North America and Europe and Australia. And my experience is that while most of these professors may be very knowledgeable in their narrow area of specialization, they are almost clueless when it comes to the evidence for Christianity. The Christian position in these debates usually comes out so far ahead that the non-believing students often accuse us of having set up the whole event as staged to make the non-Christian position look bad. In truth, we try to get the very best opponents to debate, and they're often picked by the atheist club on campus. Christian students, by contrast, come away from these debates with their heads held high, proud to be Christians. One Canadian student remarked to me after a debate, I can't wait to share my faith in Christ. People who lack training in apologetics are often afraid to share their faith in Christ or to speak up for Christ because they are deathly afraid that someone may ask them a question that they can't answer. But if you know the answers, then you're not afraid to go into the lion's den. In fact, you'll enjoy it. Training in apologetics will help to make Christians bold and fearless witnesses for Christ. Secondly, apologetics can also help us to keep the faith in times of doubt and struggle. Emotions will only carry us so far and then you're going to need something more substantial. When I speak in churches around the country, I often meet parents who come up to me after the service and say something like this, if only you'd been here two or three years ago. Our son or our daughter had questions which no one in the church could answer, and now he's far from the Lord. It just breaks my heart to meet parents like this. A Christian minister at Stanford University recently told me that 40% of the Christian high school students in church youth groups will quit 
church involvement altogether after high school graduation, 40%. And it's not just that they lose their faith in a hostile university environment. Rather, he said, many of them have already secretly abandoned their faith while in the high school youth group. But they just continue to go through the motions until they're out from under mom and dad's authority. I think the church is really failing these kids. Rather than provide them training in the defense of Christianity's truth, we focus on emotional worship experiences or felt needs or entertainment. It's no wonder that they become sitting ducks for that high school teacher or university professor who takes rational aim at their faith. In high school and college, Christian teenagers are assaulted intellectually with every manner of non-Christian philosophy uh, and ideology conjoined with an overwhelming relativism and subjectivism. How dare we send them out unarmed into an intellectual battlefield? We've got to prepare our kids for war. It's not enough for parents to just take their children to church and read them Bible stories. We've got to give our kids training in Christian doctrine and apologetics. Moms and dads need to be trained in apologetics themselves and then to impart to their children simply at first and then with increasing depth as they grow up why we believe as we do. Honestly, I find it very difficult to understand how parents can undertake parenthood in our day and age without training in Christian apologetics. Now, of course, apologetics won't guarantee that someone will keep the faith. There are all kinds of moral and spiritual factors that also come into play here. Indeed, some of the most effective atheist websites feature ex-believers who were trained in apologetics and still abandoned their faith. But when you look closely at the arguments they give for why they abandoned Christianity, you'll find that they're often confused or weak. I recently saw one website where the person provided a list of the books that had persuaded him to abandon Christian faith, followed by the comment that he hopes to read them someday. <laughs> Ironically, some of these folks come to embrace positions that are more extreme and require greater gullibility like that Jesus of Nazareth never existed or that the universe popped into being uncaused out of nothing than the conservative theological views that they once held. But while apologetics is admittedly no guarantee, it can help. Let me read you a letter which I recently received from a youth pastor. He wrote, I am a youth pastor at a large evangelical church. A few years ago, one of the elder's sons who was in high school at the time approached me and told me that he had become an atheist over the summer because science and philosophy had proven God doesn't exist. He challenged me with some quotes from Hawking, Dawkins, Hitchens, etc. And I had no responses to them. I'll never forget the look on his face when I had no reply. He started crying, and with tears running down his face, he turned around and walked out of the doors of the church, and he has never come back. That sparked something in me. I realized that there was a new language that needed to be spoken to the youth culture of today, a language that I was not fluent in. Looking back, I feel like I had no right to call myself a youth pastor at that time, but things have changed since then. Three years ago, a fellow pastor gave me your book, Reasonable Faith. It was hard to get through, but I managed to plow my way through most of it. Shortly after that, 
it seemed like atheists and agnostics were finding their way into my life. I started having debates on many issues with all of these different individuals, especially via Facebook. Issues that ranged from meaning, value, and purpose in life, morality, the existence of the universe, and much more. I am currently taking a big group of high school boys through On Guard right now, and they absolutely love it. It is so awesome to watch their faces when they come to an understanding that the cause of the universe is personal and therefore they can have a personal relationship with the cause of the universe. I have even used the Kalam cosmological argument to lead an atheistic college student to the truth of the gospel about a month ago. Now, this former skeptic is studying on guard with me too. He wants to go to seminary now and devote his life to the truth. Within the limited amount of time, I have studied Christian apologetics, he says. I have seen the youth group grow with many skeptical teens. These students want to be respected with logical and thoughtful answers to their deep questions. I am seeing kids come to Christ on a regular basis. I have also seen many of the Christian students grow stronger in their faith and bolder in their evangelism because they are not afraid of having their faith questioned. Praise God for the victory in this pastor's life. Training in apologetics is a vital tool in strengthening believers. Finally, number three, winning unbelievers, winning unbelievers. Many people would agree with what I've said about the value of apologetics in strengthening believers, but they would maintain that it's of no use in evangelizing unbelievers. No one comes to Christ through arguments, they'll tell you. Now, to a certain extent, I think that such people are just victims of false expectations. When you realize that only a minority of people who hear the gospel will respond affirmatively to it and give their lives to Christ, we shouldn't be surprised that most people will refuse to be persuaded by our arguments and evidence. We shouldn't expect the unbeliever, when he hears our apologetic case, to simply roll over and play dead. Of course he'll fight back. Think what's at stake for him. But we patiently plant and water in hopes that over time the seed will grow and bear fruit. Who knows the cumulative effect of such arguments as the seed is planted and watered and watered again in ways that we can't even imagine. So you might ask, why bother with that minority of people with whom apologetics is effective? Well, two reasons, I think. First, because every person is precious to God, a person for whom Christ died. Like a missionary who feels called to some obscure people group, so we also reach out to that minority of persons who will respond affirmatively to rational argument and evidence. But secondly, here the case differs significantly from that of the obscure people group. This people group, though relatively small in numbers, is huge in influence. One of those persons, for example, was C.S. Lewis. And think of the impact that that one man's life continues to have, even today long after his death. I find that the people who resonate most with my apologetic arguments are engineers, people in medicine, and lawyers. And these are among the most significant shapers of contemporary culture today. So reaching this minority of persons will reap a great harvest for the kingdom of God. In any case, the idea that apologetics is ineffective in, un, uh, in evangelizing unbelievers is simply not true. Lee Strobel recently remarked to me that he has lost count of the number of people 
who have come to Christ through his books, Case for Christ and the Case for Faith. Nor has it been my experience that apologetics is ineffective in evangelism. We are continually thrilled to receive emails from people telling of how they've committed their lives to Christ through hearing a, a presentation of the gospel coupled with an apologetic defense of its truth. Let me share with you one letter from one of the most hard-boiled skeptics that I have ever met in my experience. He wrote, sometime last week, I realized that I could no longer call myself a skeptic. After 15 years away from Christianity, most of which was spent as an atheist with an active, busy intent on destroying the faith, I returned to a church with a real intention of going for worship last Sunday. Although I know I may struggle with doubt for the rest of my life, my life as an atheist is over. The primary motivation for my change of heart from a Christ hater to a card-carrying Disciples of Christ member was apologetic arguments for God's existence. Briefly, I grew tired of the lack of explanation for the existence of the universe, moral values and duties, objective human worth, consciousness and will, and many other topics. The only valid foundation for many of these ideas is a personal, immaterial, unchanging, and unchangeable entity. As I fought so desperately to come up with refutations of these arguments, even going out of my way to meet personally many of their originators, defenders, and opponents, I realized that I could not answer them no matter how many long nights I spent hitting the books. The months of study rolled on to years, and eventually I found an increasing comfort around my God-believing enemies and a growing discontent and even anger at my atheist friend's inability to kill off these fleas in debate and in writing, an anger that gave birth to my first feeling of separateness from skepticism. As time went on, I reverted the path I traced after giving up Christianity long ago. I went from atheist to agnostic to gulp, leaning in the direction of God to finally accepting that he could very well exist, and then to coming out and admitting quietly he did exist. After considering deism, the belief in a God who abandons his creation, Islam, Hinduism, yes, Krishna, don't laugh, Baha'i and even Jainism briefly, I have decided to select Christianity due to its superior model for human evil and its reconciliation, coupled with the belief that God interacted with man directly and face to face and had the crucial role in this reconciliation. This, of course, doesn't prove that Christianity is absolutely true, although I can prove that God exists, but rather reflects my recognition that Christianity is exactly what I would expect to be the case given that God exists. This is all the evangelism you'll get from me, and I do hope it's quite enough to motivate you to study the evidence for God's existence yourself and to read the Bible without the predetermined idea of tearing it apart. Come over to the dark side. We have tea and cookies. So those who say that apologetics is not effective with unbelievers must be speaking out of their limited experience. When the evidence is persuasively presented and sensitively combined with a gospel presentation and a personal testimony, the Spirit of God is pleased to use it to draw people to himself. In conclusion then, apologetics is, I believe, a vital part of Christian discipleship. It plays a crucial role in shaping culture, strengthening believers, and winning unbelievers. So, 
What can you, as a Christian pastor, do in light of these truths? Well, I'm not suggesting that you all become Christian apologists. God knows that you already have enough on your plates without being saddled with another responsibility. But let me suggest some ways in which you can be an encouragement to others. Number one, identify and empower laymen to lead an apologetics ministry in your church. You should not shoulder the responsibility for leading such an apologetics ministry. But there are lay people in your church that you can empower and authorize to lead such a ministry. Seek them out, identify them, and challenge them with taking the leadership of such an apologetics ministry. You can use adult Sunday school classes as a forum for this. Offer courses in Christian doctrine, apologetics, uh, church history, New Testament survey, and so forth. I would suggest that your church budget money to pay for the training of these lay people. Help them to get an online degree or certificate in Christian apologetics, such as is offered, for example, by Biola University. This will repay great dividends in your local church. Now, if you don't have a local layperson who's ready to step up and do this, what you can do is avail yourself of our Defenders class, which is filmed in high-definition video and podcast over our Reasonable Faith website. In fact, it is now being live-streamed at 11.15 a.m. Eastern Time on Sunday morning. If you have a Sunday school class during that hour, you can set up a live streaming reception for the Defenders class, and the person in charge of this just has to know how to turn on uh, the computer and log in, and then we'll do the rest. So there is tremendous uh, availability of top resources uh, in apologetics training that you don't need to take responsibility personally for. Second, I want to encourage you to instruct your youth pastor to equip his students in the defense of the Christian faith. Make sure that this youth pastor is doing more than offering uh, worship experiences and entertainment, as important as though, uh, as though those might be. Rather, uh, take a resource like On Guard and have him lead the students through this so that they can be equipped with three or four arguments memorized for the existence of God if called upon to defend their belief in God and evidence for the radical personal claims and resurrection of Jesus. And again, I would encourage you to pay for the training of your youth pastor to make him able to do this. Let him get a certificate in apologetics online at Biola or some other institution. Thirdly, in your sermons, include apologetic nuggets about the passage that you're preaching on. For example, our pastor recently spoke on the stilling of the storm on the Sea of Galilee. And as part of his sermon, he showed PowerPoint slides of that first century Galilean fishing boat that was excavated a few years ago from the mud of the Sea of Galilee. And it made it so visual for us to understand what the boat was like that Jesus and the disciples were in when this occurred. It made it come alive and seem real. You need to help your people see that these stories are not fairy tales about what happened long, long ago in a land far, far away, but rather are real events rooted in history. Finally, number four, sponsor special events. For example, you could start an annual lecture series where once a year you would bring in a guest speaker who will give an annual lecture series on the defense of the Christian faith. You could even put on a mini conference where you bring in two or three such speakers over a weekend and people can look forward to the training that this will provide. And this will also speak volumes to your congregation about the importance of intellectual engagement uh, that your church believes in for Christian discipleship. So, in conclusion, we do face 
tremendous challenges in 21st century America. Fortunately, however, I believe that training in Christian apologetics can help to meet some of those challenges. And for that reason, I am unapologetically enthusiastic about Christian apologetics.